Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here again with you guys all. Um, let me start this here. All right. All right. I'm gonna view, let you. I'm gonna put on my screen here. Uh, PowerPoint we're gonna do today. We're gonna continue on with the uh, study that we've been doing on the seven trumpets. So I'm gonna adjust the screen here so you guys can see it. All right. All right. I think everybody can see that, right? All right. So we're going to go ahead and and have a word of prayer as we go into this study. Again, I say happy Sabbath to everyone. It's my honor, it's my privilege to be here with you today. And I just pray that the sweet Holy Spirit will fall upon each and every one of us as we listen to His Word for us at such a time as this. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank You so much for Your wonderful love and Your mercy. We want to thank you, dear God, that your Holy Spirit truly is sweet. And so, dear Father, you have asked us that if we pray for anything according to your will, it will be done. So at this time, dear God, we pray that your truth will come upon us in the form of rain. That we would receive a refreshing from you. That will animate us. And illuminate us as bright, shining, blazing torches. We know that, dear God, everything in your word is important. And so we come to you today to receive of you. Your sweet Holy Spirit. Your name written on our foreheads. That we may be able to go forth as your battle men and women into the war to finish it. So dear God, speak through me, use me as your mouthpiece, empty me of self, and bless us all. For we commit ourselves and we commit this time to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we started a, a series a couple of weeks ago entitled The Seven Trumpets. We've been looking at The Seven Trumpets uh, and we've been seeing the lessons that God has in these messages for us. And so the first week, two weeks ago, the first week was just an introduction to this study. We learned that a trumpet in prophetic language signifies several things, not just one thing, several things. It represents an alarm. It also represents preparation for some type of destruction that is, was about to take place. It represents a call to battle. It's a call from Christ. It's a call also to the day of atonement. God wants us to become at one with Him so that the great controversy could finally be ended. That's how the great controversy will be finally ended. When we become at one with God. It's a call also to God's people to move forward. As God's enemies, as the enemies of God's church are, are, are having uh, destruction come upon them or judgments fall upon them, God's people should be taking advantage and moving forward. Moving forward. The trumpets of Revelation 8 to 10 represent all of these things that I just previously mentioned. But primarily we saw that they represent the destruction of God's enemies as we move forward and for us to move forward. We also learned that the seven trumpets unfold to us at the altar of incense found in the holy place. Uh, as Elder Ken is uh, doing his study, which he started last night on the sevens, um, he started with the seven churches, right? Right? The seven churches also unfold in the holy place at the seven candlestick. The seven seals also unfold to us in the holy place at the altar of, uh, the, not the altar, the table of showbread. Well, in like manner, 
the seven trumpets unfold to us at the altar of incense. All of these articles coexist in the holy place and all of the work in these three areas happened during around the same period of time. And so we know also that Christ went into the holy place, AD 31, and he was doing a work there in 1844. All these things are significant for us to, to understand the movements that are taking place in heaven as they correspond with the movements that are taking place on earth. We also learned some of the symbols used in the book of Revelation that describe the power of God that fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. We learned some of these symbols that led the disciples to begin sounding the alarms of mercy to the Jewish nation at that time. And last week, we learned that the first trumpet signified the awful judgment that fell upon Jerusalem as a result of their rejection of Christ. We saw that hail and fire mingled with blood represented the horrific annihilation of the Jews in A.D. 70 by Titus. The Bible says, O Jerusalem, thou hast destroyed thyself. We learned that third part that phrase we learned that third part represents those that were deceived by Satan we saw that the trees were the leaders we saw the green grass were the people the Jews had become the enemies of God's true church we saw that like the parable of the rich man and Lazarus Israel had become rich in pride and failed to share her riches of the gospel to the poor as they were bidden to by God. Same thing can apply to us, brethren. We have been given the riches of the gospel to be given to the poor or to those who are in darkness today. So we learned many lessons in the last couple of weeks. And if you missed any of those first studies, you can access them on on my YouTube page or Facebook pages. Um, but today we're going to be looking at the second trumpet found in Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to move forward now. Now, in Revelation chapter 8 and, 8 and verse 9, it says this, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. There is a lot in these two verses. But again, the book of Revelation uses many symbols to describe prophetic events. A lot of metaphoric language we find in the book of Revelation. Many people are scared to touch it. But the mere title of the book tells us that it is a revelation, not a mystery. It's a revelation to God's people. So why is it that God, you know, used all these symbols? in the book of Revelation. We want to touch that for a moment here. God did this, brethren, so that the Word could be preserved in reality. We know that God preserves His Word, but this is one of the methods in which God actually, in His wisdom, preserved His Word. You see, if He could have His prophets write in a clear standard language, Everything, all, so that there would be no mysteries. The Bible would have been furiously attacked and even outlawed across the world a long time ago. Many of us probably wouldn't even be able to access the Bible. And I believe, in my uh, estimation of things, I believe that God in His wisdom directed such mysterious symbolism in order to actually, to use that as a method 
to preserve his word. He promised to reveal the secrets to his servants, did he? In Amos 3, 7. Jesus, in speaking with the Father, said, I thank thee. And he spoke with the Father here in Matthew chapter 11, 25. He says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Praise God. You see, the wise and prudent think they're so wise, they have no clue what these symbols mean. It's the humble ones that understand the mysterious language of the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 12 and verse 2 tells us that we dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear but hear not. Why? For they are a rebellious house. You see, brethren, there's conditions that need to be met in order to have these symbols revealed to us. If we're wise and prudent, we will never able, be able to see them. But let's move forward as we go on now. Let's move forward. So what does a mountain represent in Revelation 8 and verse 8? It says, A great mountain was burning with fire. A great mountain. And the second angel sounded... And as it were, a great mountain, burning with fire, was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. What does this mountain represent? Remember, God reveals these symbols to His people so that they can understand what God is trying to reveal to us and what He's trying to teach us. He wants us to be prepared for His second coming. So He reveals these things, the secrets. He reveals them to His people. So what does this mountain represent? Let's see if we can find out. A mountain, brethren, is a kingdom. Notice here in Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 24 and 25. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of, Chal of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain. Notice it, 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 it calls Babylon a destroying mountain. And it says, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee a burnt, a burnt mountain. Notice there, I will make thee a burnt mountain. What was that mountain that we saw before? It was a mountain that was burning. Wasn't it? Notice here it says, I will make thee a burnt mountain. You see how the Bible, the Bible is so beautiful. The Bible actually explains itself. We don't have to interpret anything in the Bible. Truth reveals itself. If you study the Bible line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. We see here in this quotation, Babylon here we see clearly that a mountain is a symbol that represents a kingdom. These scriptures are describing the kingdom of Babylon, as I already mentioned. They are described as a destroying mountain. God was pronouncing judgment. He was foretelling the judgment that was going to come upon them for destroying all the earth at that time. The second verse describes their destruction and their final outcome that they would become as a burnt mountain with these verses we can come to the understanding that a mountain burning with fire represents a kingdom that is about to receive judgments in the time of Daniel Babylon wanted to rule the world and actually did world, rule the world but he wanted to rule the world perpetually this is why King Nebuchadnezzar what did he do he made that statue even though Daniel had revealed to him that he wasn't going to rule the world forever he said yes I am and he in his pride he made a golden statue made out of completely gold he wanted to rule perpetually even though in in the dream that he had the statue had many different medals which represented different kingdoms that would rule the world even up to the coming of Christ but God foretold 
that there would be other kingdoms after Babylon. And that at the end, God would set up a kingdom, brothers and sisters, that would last forever. But it too, that kingdom that God would set up, that would last forever, was also represented by a mountain. Notice here, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, here's the statue that we see, the prophetic uh, dream that the, the, the king had, represented all these world kingdoms to the end of the world. But it says here, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. No, notice that the wind carried them away. Why? Because everything's going to become ashes, as Elder Ken so eloquently stated in his Sabbath school presentation. Everything will be made dust and it will be carried away by the wind. Notice there. It will be carried away, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Praise the Lord. Again, the Bible gives us another witness to unravel the mystery of the symbolic or the symbolism behind this term mountain used in prophetic language. In the book of Jeremiah, we received a clue as to what a mountain on fire represented, a kingdom under judgment. And so in the second trumpet, brothers and sisters, a kingdom was about to receive judgment. But first we need to go back and remember that when the seven trumpets uh, that the seven trumpets actually parallel the seven churches and the seven seals or the time periods. They parallel those time periods. All three of these, as I said before, represent three articles of furniture in the holy place. As we already went into that. Last week we saw that the first trumpet began at the first church period, which was Ephesus, which was the apostolic era. During that time, Israel was destroyed. That was the first trumpet. Eventually, judgment fell upon Babylon. Right? And it was conquered and destroyed by Medio Persian. And in the second trumpet, so in parallel to this, what we see with, with Babylon, the second trumpet, we will see that judgment falls upon another power. And that power, what power was it that existed during the apostolic age that destroyed Jerusalem? It was pagan Rome. Pagan Rome. Remember that a trumpet represents God's people going forward and their enemies coming down. Those who reject the gospel receive judgments. These aren't necessarily coming from God um, proactively. These are as a result of pushing God's protection away. Because God is the one restraining. Remember, there's angels that are right now working all across the globe, restraining the powers of destruction that are natural in nature, restraining human passion. They're restraining us Christians from falling back into the carnal nature. Right? If it wasn't for the angels of God, oh, we would be in big trouble. But those who reject the gospel receive judgment. And it came first to Jerusalem, the first trumpet. And now, it's going to be, we'll see that it, it, it came to pagan Rome in the second trumpet. So let's move forward. Notice here first the parable of a fig tree. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 19 to 22, notice here something very interesting. This was Jesus, and he was with his disciples. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it. Actually, he was, coming to, he was hoping to find some figs, right? To find some fruit. He came to it and found nothing thereon. There was no figs on it. It was barren. But leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? <coughs> 
Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Notice he's talking about a mountain here. He tells the disciples, If you have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed. And be thou cast into the sea. What did we see? We saw a mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. It shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Wow. Interesting, isn't it? Notice something here, brothers and sisters. Christ in this parable, it was a living parable, by the way. But notice here, Christ is actually foretelling both the destruction of Jerusalem as well as the destruction of pagan Rome. As we learned last week, Jerusalem was represented as the fig tree that would bear no fruit. And pagan Rome is the mountain cast into the sea. <coughs> Jesus ends by giving the disciples a clue as to how pagan Rome would be finally removed. They were to pray for it to be removed. Prayer, brothers and sisters, unlocks God's hands and places them in motion. Praise God. You see, this was a, also a prophecy. Christ was foretelling what was coming soon. He was pro pronouncing these things to the disciples so that they can pray. God did not curse the fig tree because the fig tree represented something. It represented the Jewish nation. Christ was foretelling that the Jewish nation in rejection of their Messiah cursed themselves. Praise the Lord that God, we know that God has no, uh, He has no, no doing in the cursing. God does not curse anything. The only thing that comes from God are blessings. You can find that in Psalm 145, 17. All His ways are holy and all His works are righteousness. God doesn't do anything to hurt anyone. But people hurt themselves. Nations hurt themselves by rejecting their protector who has angels restraining the things around them so that they can live in a perfectly protected environment. Let's move forward. So the mountain was pagan Rome and pagan Rome was cast into the sea. But what does this mean? Revelation 8, 8, again, the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was the, was what? Cast into the sea. If the mountain is symbolic, being cast in the sea has to also be symbolic. In Revelation 8, 8, the mountain was cast into the sea. But what does this mean? Sounds confusing, doesn't it? According to Revelation 17, 15, brothers and sisters, if you go back and look at Revelation 17, verse 15, seas or waters represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The beautiful thing about this series that we're doing here is that it teaches us that the Bible is its own interpreter. You see, many people like to try to bring in their own interpretations to the Bible. But as God's people, the people of the book, we, ha we can't do that. We have to allow the Bible itself to interpret itself and give us the definitions of the symbols. And Revelation 17, 15 tells us that the seas or the waters represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. 
We don't need to be in confusion. The keys have been given to us so that we could have clarity. When pagan Rome fell, it was not concerned, it, it was not uh, conquered. It was not conquered by another nation. Pagan Rome was not conquered by another nation. It was swallowed up, in a sense, by its own people or the, or the people of Europe. So in that sense, it was cast into the sea. It was the sea that swallowed up pagan Rome. It was the peoples, the nations, the tongues. It was all of these things that swallowed up Rome. Rome actually, you know, eventually became divided, right? Into ten different other nations. But the judgment that fell upon it came from within its own territories, you see, Satan's government, brethren, never be deceived, right? The only sure government that exists in the universe is the government of God. Satan's government is unsustainable. It's self-destructive. Satan's cause always gets hurt, but it gets hurt by its own weapons. In other words, Satan's always shooting himself in the foot so to speak this is what happens as a result of the prayers of the saints you see Satan's governments cannot be destroyed or conquered if the saints aren't praying this is why it's so important for us brothers is to be praying for Jesus to come to be praying that this final work will be completed because it is as we pray that movements take place. It is the prayers of the saints that put God's hands in motion. Legally, He can move forward doing things that we pray for. But we need to pray. We heard in the Bible He was looking for somebody to pray, to stand in the gap and at a particular time, and He found none. So there was destruction upon the church at the time, or, those, or His people. He needs people to pray. So prayer is very critical. So that means the saints were praying. And pagan Rome came down, crashing. Prayer is the greatest weapon that we have in our arsenal. As pagan Rome was going down, another power was coming up. Satan doesn't give up. Even though one thing after another, one, 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 uh, 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 one tool that he uses or one nation of... Whatever he uses, as it comes down, he thinks of another plan. Or he, he, he doesn't give up. He's relentless. So as pagan Rome was going down, another power was coming up. But something had to happen to, his, to God's people in order for that to happen. All of this would actually happen because compromise began to creep in. We're going to see that as we move forward. In Revelation 8.8, 8, it says that the third part of the sea, we know that the great mountain, representing pagan Rome, was cast into, into the sea, was swallowed up by its own inhabitants. But it says here, the third part of the sea became blood. Here we see something very interesting. The third part of the sea became blood or beca it becomes blood and we, we know that the sea represents peoples you know multitudes nations but notice here it says third part third part of the sea became blood last week we learned what the term third part represents as I said already in Bible uh, symbolism it represents those that became deceived those that became deceived. We also learned that blood also represented judgment. Now what was happening during this time? We know that there's a lot of things that was happening during this time. This was a time of great persecution. But we're going to look into that as we go forward. So it has a dual application, we could say, right? As, as, we, as we continue. But let's go to the next slide. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Notice here. Paul prophesied of the fall of pagan Rome. 
in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Notice what it says here. And let me see if I can uh, fix this a little bit here. Okay. Notice what it says here. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter. And notice why he, why he says not to be troubled. Something was taking place. He said, let not be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, not even, a, not even by a letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He was telling them that the, the coming of Christ was not going to take place in their day. Notice here. Don't be troubled because the day of Christ, in other words, he's saying, is not at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Then he tells them what, what, had, what needs to take place before the coming of Christ in the clouds of glory. He says, that day shall not come. And notice here that he's speaking about our day. Because we're living in this day now. Christ is coming in our day, brothers and sisters. But they weren't, Christ was not coming in their day. But notice here, what had to happen first? For that day shall not come, except there shall come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's an interesting term there, the son of perdition. That, that was a term that was used to describe Judas, by the way. Judas was like part of the church, but he was compromised. So what happened? We had A leader had to come up that was going to be a compromised leader. You notice here, the son of perdition would be his name, or the term used to describe him. Who opposes and exalteth, exalteth himself above all that is called God. So this person, this being, this man of sin, would exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, or pretending to be God, or wanting to be God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What is the temple of God? The church. So this false uh, disciple would stand up in the church, in the group, like Judas was among the twelve. The twelve symbolizes God's church, God's kingdom. And this Judas would rise up, claiming himself to be God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then the apostle tells the disciples, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. And notice what he says next. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Something had to be taken out of the way for this Judas to rise up. This is very important. Paul had some deep insight into future events. Why? Because God reveals his secrets to his servants. You see? He knew some secrets. Just like God is revealing to us secrets today. Paul understood. Here he is foretelling of both pagan Rome's fall and the rise of papal Rome. Pagan Rome had to be taken out of the way in order to make room for papal Rome. This could only happen as a result of a falling away. Notice. What is a falling away? A religious compromise. Or as also termed apostasy. Brothers and sisters, what we see today is a grand apostasy taking place also in the world. And this man of sin is being revealed. He's already been revealed, but he's going to be revealed even more so just before the coming of Christ. We're looking at these things in the series that we're doing on Tuesday evenings, The Essence of Time. But... We're not going to go in too deep into that right now. But these are very serious things. And these very verses, brethren, are describing the prophecy that was fulfilled 
in the second trumpet. These very verses are the fulfillment of the second trumpet. Let's go back. So notice here now in Revelation 8 and verse 9, the second verse dealing with the second trumpet. Notice, the third part of the creatures. Remember, third part means, means those that were deceived or compromised, right? And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea. So now we're looking at creatures in the sea that had life. But notice, the creatures which were in the sea and had life past tense died and the third part of the ships ships were destroyed we'll look at that later but now we're going to focus on the creatures which were in the sea that had life now here we read again the second verse relative to the second trumpet and what we want to focus on is these creatures in the sea that had life and they died but we're going to see what what these creatures who are the creatures that had life in the sea? Remember the sea where the peoples, the multitudes, nations, and tongues, right? Notice here, let's go to the next uh, slide. Creatures actually represent souls, brethren. Souls that receive the gospel. Notice here, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, talking about people, if ye Continue in the faith, grounded and settled. That means fixed. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached unto what? Every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, Paul made it very clear that creatures are souls of men that receive the gospel in this verse. Creatures with life then are those that have accepted Jesus Christ who is the truth the way and the life and you know this calling God wants to give he has given to all of us he wants all to receive it he wants all of us to be creatures with life if today we feel like we're living dead filled with discouragement God is giving us a call he wants us to give him the opportunity to make us his creatures with life Jesus also confirms that uh, he confirms this very fact matter of fact in Matthew chapter 16 verse 15 where he tells us go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature taking the gospel to the world is the same as taking it to the creatures of the seas in this picture notice here I put a nice picture here in this slide in this picture we see the gospel being accepted by a creature in the sea I just use that as a you know object lesson right You're getting baptized in the sea right through baptism okay we know the seas represent people, multitude, nation, and tongue, but I wanted to just give you a nice uh, 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 illustration here. A creature in the sea. We see there. A creature in the sea. Now, the next slide. We go into the third part. So those are the ones that had life. And by the way, let's go back to the, this previous slide. Notice that it says, uh, uh, let's, no, let's go to the slide before that. Notice it says that they died. They had life and died. Uh, the time of the second church era was a time not only uh, and we're going to go into this a little further but um, was a time when there was a lot of persecution and a lot, a lot of God's true creatures were being killed they were being executed second church period we're going to look at that in a minute as we go forward but anyway just want to make that point out so they were dying physically and also the others were dying spiritually because many were compromising at the same time so we're going we're to move forward now but notice here, some other part of this second trumpet, the second verse of the second trumpet says, the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, so here we read about the third part of the ships being destroyed. But before we go there, again, I want to emphasize on the fact that one third is symbolic of those that 
once accepted the gospel, but have now fallen away or died. There's, uh, I said, a dual, dual application. There was a time of great persecution. Christians were being slaughtered all throughout Christendom during this time. But many were compromising. So they were dying both ways. Some were dying physically, faithful to God. Others were dying spiritually by compromising. To They're compromising their faith. Satan was doing something. But he was doing something as a result of something that was taking place in Christendom. Which is going to be taking place and is taking place right now, brothers and sisters, in this time of earth's history. That's going to cause Satan to panic. And I think he's already panicking to a certain degree. But at that time, Satan also began to panic. Notice here. The blood of the martyrs, brethren. He was killing Christians left and right. But the blood of the martyrs was seed. And Satan began to panic. Notice here in Great Controversy 42, paragraph 3, a nice uh, commentary on this time, a historical commentary. Notice here, the great adversary, Satan, now endeavored to gain by artifice what he had failed to secure by force. You see, the more people he was killing, the more Christians were being added to the church. His methods were failing. And he had to come up with a different plan. He began to panic. He began to strategize. Persecution ceased. And in its stead were substituted the dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honor. Idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith while they rejected other essential truths. They professed to accept Jesus as the Son of God and to believe in His death and resurrection, but they had no conviction of sin and felt no need of repentance or of a change of heart. That's happening today. Many people think that just by believing, they're okay. But there has to be a real serious uh, 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 conviction of, of a need to repent of our sins and to turn from those sins and change and have a change of heart. There has to be a transformation in our hearts, brothers and sisters. With some concessions on their part, they proposed that Christians should make concessions and that all might unite on the platform of simply believing in Christ. That is a dangerous place to be. Because the Bible says that even the devil and his angels believe and tremble, but they're lost. Fire and brimstone are reserved for them. That means they're lost. They have sealed their fate, even though they believe. What does that tell us? That belief is not good enough. The real evidence of real belief, a real surrender, is there's a change of heart. There's a transformation. I'm going to ask all of you to put your mics on mute. Because I'm hearing some background noise so I would I respectfully ask everyone to put their mics on mute okay let's move forward So notice here, during the church period, which was known to be Smyrna, Satan's strategy had to change. Persecution had to cease. And then allurements of temporal prosperity, worldly honor, were now offered. Persecution actually, brothers and sisters, was a blessing compared to compromise. And we know the same thing is going to happen now. We're going to be going through some waves of persecution but at the same time there's going to be allurements some people will be allured and offered uh, temporal prosperity and worldly honor Satan is going to try to throw um, all types of things to different types of people to get them to compromise let's move forward 
So compromise did something. Compromise brought about the papacy. Notice here, in this commentary, it continues. It says, the church was in fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire, sword were blessings in comparison with this compromise. Some of the Christians stood firm, declaring that they, they could make no compromise. Others were in favor of yielding or modifying some features of their faith and uniting with those who had accepted a part of Christianity, urging that this might be the means of their full conversion. Isn't that what we do today? Many churches, they begin to lower the standard, saying, maybe we can reach other people. Maybe if we just lower down the standards and stop preaching the truth so, so, so clearly, maybe if we just start bringing in some different type of music into our church that will attract those of the world, maybe they will be converted. Isn't that what we do today? Isn't that what the majority of the churches are doing today, brothers and sisters? Compromise leads to destruction. It has to be the truth that attracts. Not music. Not sensationalism. Not some type of excitement. It has to be the truth and the truth alone because the truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. The problem, is, the problem with men is they want to have their own method to try to draw all men to Christ. Instead of lifting Him up, the truth, they say, well, bring in music, different types of music, different types of entertainment, different types of allurements. We'll water down the messages a little bit, give them smooth things that make them feel good and make them feel saved. And what happens? Destruction comes. Brethren, we're living in serious times. Let's continue reading this quotation. Notice here. We don't want to be like these others that were in favor of yielding or modifying some features of their faith and, and uniting with those who had accepted part of Christianity, urging that this might be the means of their full conversion. That was a time of deep anguish to the faithful followers of Christ. Notice that the faithful followers of Christ were in anguish. They were sighing and crying for the abominations that were taking place in the church. They would make no compromise. They stood firm and said, No, we will not compromise, even though the majority is doing so. Under a cloak of pretended Christianity, Satan was insinuating himself into the church. Notice who was coming into the church? Satan himself. He was coming into the temple of God, sitting himself as the king of the temple of God, making himself to be God through his man of sin, the Judas. That we're going to see about in a minute. So under a cloak of pretended Christianity, Satan was insinuating himself into the church to corrupt their faith and turn their minds from the word of truth, which is who? Jesus Christ. The truth, the way, and the life. He said, if I, the truth, be lifted up, I will draw men. Don't worry about it. You don't have to water down the message. You don't have to bring in compromise. You don't have to bring in anything to mesmerize them or entertain them. Just lift me up. I will be the one to draw them. Those who really want to eat the bread of life and want to live. The visible church, brethren. The visible. Notice there I put there on the, as a subtitle there. The visible church lost its purity that means the true church became invisible the true church became the invisible church they were now worshiping in the mountains in the caves and everywhere but the visible church lost its purity just like today most of the visible churches lost their purity notice here most of the Christians at last consented notice how many few no, most. This is the majority, brethren. And this is the same condition that the world, remember, the same condition will exist just before the coming of the Son of God because remember, this is what Paul had said in his prophetic declaration that the man of sin would be revealed, there will be a falling away. Same thing has to exist and it's existing today. 
Most of the Christians at last consented to lower their standard and a union was formed between Christianity and paganism. Although the worshippers of idols professed to be converted and united with the church, they still clung to their idolatry, only changing the objects of their worship to images of Jesus and even of Mary and the saints. The foul leaven of idolatry thus brought into the church continued its baleful work. Unsound doctrines, superstitious rites, and idolatrous ceremonies were incorporated into her faith and worship. As the followers of Christ united with idolaters, the Christian religion became corrupted and the church lost her purity and power. There were some, however, who were not misled by these delusions. They still maintained their fidelity to the author of truth and worshiped God alone. They worshiped their God in obscurity. They were now the invisible church of God, the true church. Remember that Jesus came to the professed church, the visible church, at his time. This is why we, we, you know, I emphasize this many times because many, uh, many of us that are uh, that all of, all of us that are faithful, we're going to come to crossroads, brethren. We're going to come to a place where we're going to have to stand alone because most are going to forsake us and forsake Jesus Christ. God has a people, and they are what is termed the invisible church the faithful ones, those who will stand for the truth though the heavens fall. Notice the last part of this verse. Or notice verse, uh, this verse in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19. We're talking about ships, right? Ships that were destroyed. We're going to see that ships being destroyed actually means uh, it, it is, is a symbol for a shipwreck of faith a shipwreck of faith because God's church is also symbolized as, as ships we're going to see that we're going to see where we get that term the ship a lot of people say if you leave the ship you're going to be lost we're going to we're going to look at that term as we go forward so we were looking here at, as ships that were destroyed that it's equivalent to shipwreck of faith Notice 1 Timothy, Timothy 1 verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having, putting away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Notice there. Putting away faith is equivalent to a shipwreck. Do we see that there? 1 Timothy 1 19. Notice here that to put away faith is described as destroying the ship. Or the ship being shipwrecked. But what is the ship? Is it the church organization, the visible churches? Is it the church buildings? Is it the church congregations? Is it the church unions or conferences? Not at all. Remember it says here, faith talking about faith so it is faith those that have faith and hold on to the true faith those who are holding on to Christ those who are converted those who are surrendered those who are being sanctified but what faith can human faith really make up the ship or is it the faith of Jesus Christ that we find in the book of Revelation, those that have the faith of Jesus. You see, we could be on the ship that is sailing to the crystal shores of the New Jerusalem. Or we could be on a ship that's about to be shipwrecked. But we want to be on that ship that's going to the crystal shores of the New Jerusalem. But how? How can we go there? How could we be on that ship? It's by allowing Jesus to be our faith and be our ship. Jesus must be the ship. 
You see, when Noah and his family went into the ark, which was a big ship, it was a symbol of them being hidden in Christ. Christ represented the ship. They were hid in Christ. Any other ship other than Jesus Christ will be a shipwrecked ship. Let's move forward. Let's continue. Because our ship needs an anchor. I mean, we sing that song, Let Your Anchor Hold, right? Our ship needs to be anchored. Hebrews 6 verses 18 and 19, you see an anchored ship is not going to be shipwrecked. It is a ship without an anchor that gets wrecked. Notice here in Hebrews 6 verses 18 and 19. We might have a strong con consol consolation who have fled for refuge. Fred, fled for refuge where? To lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have, which we have as an anchor of the soul. Wow. Beautiful quotation. You know, anchors, as I said before, are related to ships. And an anchor that has a, a ship that has an anchor is one that will not get shipwrecked. Right? So one lesson that we can take away from this study, my brethren, is that God is encouraging each and every one of us to hold fast, to hold on, or to anchor fast. To Jesus Christ we need to grab a hold of hope the blessed hope our ship of faith must be anchored by our blessed hope Jesus is both the ship and the anchor if we cling to him faith and hope will never fail you know just to use something that happened this week there was a glee star I know many some of us might have saw this in the news Articles. There was a Glee star. This this uh, this this lady, a young lady, uh, a Spanish uh, Latin uh, young lady, a Glee star. She was an actress. She passed away this week. I know probably some people heard of that here in America. She passed away. She had gone swimming with her son, right? And she was on a little boat, right? But she did something. She would made a big mistake. She forgot to anchor her boat. She forgot to anchor the boat. The boat began to drift and in a panic. She took a hold of her son and swam as fast as possible to the drifting boat. When she finally reached the boat, she only had enough strength left to help push her son back onto the boat. Sadly, when her son looked back, to look back to, towards his mother he saw his mother disappearing down into the depths of the sea she was being swallowed up by the sea remember the great mountain that's going to be swallowed up by the sea it also represents us brethren if we allow ourselves to compromise so let us not fail brethren to anchor fast like many people do let us not compromise our faith or our blessed hope. After the fall of pagan Rome, many compromised their Christianity with paganism. Their ships, their faith was destroyed. It's a lesson for us today that compromise will lead to shipwreck in any shape or form. Let's move on. In Revelation, now so, so ships, now notice here, ships are for trading. The Bible tells us that ships are for a purpose. Ships are for trading by sea. Notice in Revelation 18, verses 17, For in one hour so great riches is come to naught, and every ship master, and all the company in ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off. So notice, ships, another, another thing that we need to learn about ships, because 
Remember, ship, a ship is a church, right? But notice here, ships carry goods and merchandise upon the sea. Isn't that so? Isn't that what we read there? Every shipmaster and all the companies and ships and sailors, uh, as many as traded by sea. Ships carry goods and merchandise upon the seas. The spiritual application to the symbolic terminology is likened to the church because remember Christ is the ship but the ship also represents the church that is in Christ just like Noah was hidden in the ship hidden in Christ the church are those hidden in the ship so the ship also represents the church the church is on the ship it's part of the ship the spiritual application is that the church is to carry the gospel which are uh, are the, the, the goods and merchandise to peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. In other words, to the sea or in the sea. You notice that? God's people, His church, hidden in the ship, which is Jesus Christ, on the seas are to go forward to give His merchandise, the gospel, to all of the seas, which is the peoples of the world. This is the work of the church. This is what God is calling us for. Merchant ships, brethren, also represent the church or the work of the church. Notice here, Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 1. I want to show you that Proverbs 31 is a prophecy. Notice here that it says, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Notice there. Notice here that although Proverbs 31 describes to us the characteristics of a virtuous woman, if you go on to read it, many of us look at that and, and we, we get the understanding of what a virtuous woman is. It is really a prophecy. This prophecy talks to us about corrupt women and a virtuous woman. Two different types of women. What do we find in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 17. Two different types of women. The pure woman in Revelation chapter 12. The virtuous woman. And the corrupt woman in Revelation chapter 17. If you go back and read verses 1 to 9 of Proverbs chapter 31, you will read about the strange women, or the corrupt women, strange women, that give wine to kings in order to get them drunken so that they would forget God's ways or what God would have told them. What was it that God wanted them to remember? These women gave the kings wine in order to get them to forget what God said to remember. And what is it that God wanted them to remember? Their poverty and their misery without Him. The rest of the chapter of Proverbs 31 goes on to ask the question, Who can know a virtuous woman? And brethren, the virtuous woman, as I already stated, is symbolic of the true church of God. And her work, we're going to see what it was and what, what it is as we look at Proverbs 31 and verse 14. Notice what it says in verse 14 of Proverbs 31. It says, She, the woman, the virtuous woman, the church of God, is like the merchant's ships. She brings her food from afar. She brings food. What food? The whole purpose of the church, we know that food is what? The bread of life, isn't it? God says, bring ye all the tithe into my storehouse that there may be food in my house. Isn't that so? What food? Physical food? No. Spiritual food, which is what? The Word of God. The truth. It's Jesus Christ. 
He is the food. He is the bread of life. And he has wine. But it's unmingled with, it's not fermented. It's pure juice, the pure grape juice. It's the pure living truth. It's the word of God. Fountains of living waters. Again, she is like a merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. The whole purpose of the church, which the Jews during the first trumpet failed to do, is the same work of the merchant ships to bring food from afar. Food supports life. Remember, there was creatures in the sea that had life because they were eating the food. Food supports life. It gives nourishment to the body. A main staple of food is bread. The church is to bring the bread of life to souls near and far in order that others may receive spiritual life and have that type of life more abundantly. Praise the Lord. So merchant ships are the work of the church. Notice that she perceives in verse 18 of Proverbs 31, she perceives that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. The merchandise of the, of the church, we're told here, is good. She is clothed with Christ's righteousness. Therefore, she brings forth good fruits. Her light goes not out in the night. You see, brethren, when pagan Rome fell, the professed church married a new king. She married Constantine and divorced Jesus Christ. And so the same thing is taking place today. We're in the middle of a great night. The earth is being uh, shadowed by darkness. But God is calling us to be the merchant ships bringing good merchandise with a candle that does not go out. I remember the words of a martyr that was being burned at the stake and he said, today, he had so much faith um, and hope. He was grounded in Jesus Christ. He said, today, and he was encouraging his other fellow martyr. They were both, two men were going to be taken at the stake. I think it was uh, Latimer. It was a time when Latimer was being persecuted and it was about to get burned at the stake. Him and another, another uh, brother. And, he, and one of them says, Today, my brother, be encouraged. For today, a light will be kindled that will never go out. Praise the Lord. God's church, no matter what they do to us, they can put us in prison. They can persecute us. They can lock us up in a dungeon. They can execute us. But the light, they can never make it go out. The light will never go out. The light of Christ will shine brighter and brighter until the noonday. It will cause Satan to panic. There will be a Sunday law, a death decree. And the wicked are the ones that are going to be destroyed. Notice that. There's going to be a, a Sunday law and a death decree which will bring an end to the wicked and to Satan and his government. Isn't that amazing? The same weapons that he, he invents to try to bring against God's people will end up destroying himself and his own people. But God loves those people that are being deceived. And God is calling us to be those merchant ships today. To bring good merchandise. Not bad merchandise. Not a compromised merchandise. Because that ship will wreck. Let's continue. Let's look at the true merchant ship as we close. Coming to a close now. Notice here. This is my final slide, by the way. The true merchant ship. This is what we want to be, brothers and sisters. This is what God is calling us to be today. This is the greatest lesson that we learn in this second trumpet. Notice, this is another commentary. Upward look. Page 315, paragraph 5, and Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Notice, God has a church. This is the true merchant ship. 
It is not the great cathedral. Neither is it the national establishments. Neither is it the various denominations. It is the people, brethren. It is made out of people who love God and keep His commandments. How can we do that? By surrendering all to Christ. By allowing is about hiding ourselves in the ship, in the ark, so that we won't be destroyed by the oceans, the waves of the oceans. Notice that in Noah's day, the waves of the oceans were trying to come upon the ship, but it had no power upon the ship, which represented Jesus Christ. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Where Christ is even among the humble few, this is Christ's church. For the presence of the High and Holy One, who inhabiteth eternity, can alone constitute a church. Praise the Lord. God, brethren, is calling us today to be the ones, the merchant ships, bringing good merchandise. The only way we can become these brethren this way is by having a transformation, a change of heart. In order for the second trumpet to blow, there had to be a compromise coming up. There was much persecution, but that's not really what brought down uh, it kind of it, it kind of in a sense because God's people were multiplying and why were they multiplying because they were being faithful and they were praying notice that it was the prayers of the saints that brought down that mountain into the that burning mountain into the into the sea we need to be now praying as never before studying as never before drawing close to God's people as never before drawing close to Jesus Christ as never before this is a time just before the second coming of Christ. Those prophecies were pointing to the day, to our day. So be encouraged today. And if you haven't done that yet, if you haven't really hid yourself in Christ, in the ship, God is inviting you today to hide yourself in the ship of protection. When all of the things that happen on this earth come to pass, it will be powerless against those hidden in the ship, Jesus Christ. May God continue to bless each and every one of us as we continue to draw near to Him, as we continue to draw near to each other, as we continue to sharpen each other and pray for each other and love one another, as we continue to become the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful manifestation of your Holy Spirit. Truly you have spoken to us, dear God, and you have given us lessons to learn in the second trumpet. We know there's going to be persecution just like in the second trumpet. We know many blood, much blood is going to be shed in, in, in different ways, maybe, maybe even in, in character defamation and slander. But we know, dear Father, that your true people will have discernment and they will stand firm and, and, and peaceful and people will see that. The blood of the martyrs were seed back then and we know that the blood of your martyrs today will also be seed. So persecution will, will, will exist. And there's going to be compromise at the same time. And as we see, the majority are compromising today. But dear Father, we have good hope as we cling on to the faith of Jesus Christ. That as we Remain hidden in Him as we surrender all to You and let go of all of our cherished idols and, get, and, and do away with compromise. You will polish us. You will refine us. You will make us as the great merchant ships that bring good merchandise upon the seas. Hey, Father, I pray for every person that's hearing this message. I pray that for a special blessing that falls upon, that a special blessing will fall upon each person that your Holy Spirit will gently guide each individual step by step according to their capacity according, according to my capacity according to all of our capacity that we may continue to move upward and forward as the trumpets are blaring 
We pray, dear Lord, that you would be, we would co cooperate with you in the work of sanctifying our hearts. And that you may receive all the glory, that this earth may be filled with your glory. That you may come finally and end the bloodshed and make a new earth. That there may be no more sin, no more sorrow. And that we can continue to learn throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity and enjoy our fellowship forever. For Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen.